Hallelujah. The last few years, the Lord has just kind of stirred me that we, we just pass over Easter too quick. And we just kind of, oh, well, it's Easter. He was raised from the dead. But, but I, I just felt like the Lord really stirred me up. Really, it actually started three years ago just to talk about the resurrection till Pentecost. You know, I mean, we talk about it all year in different ways. But, but uh, man, we're, we're moving to the next step, and that's the step for the believer, and that's Pentecost. Because that's where we get our power to live what Jesus did when he was raised from the dead. Amen? And so uh, what I want to share with you are some basic, simple things uh, that, that we can understand. And, and listen, I, I said this Sunday, and I, I'm, I'm going to just say it again so you'll know this. If you don't hold on to your living faith in the resurrection, you'll lose hope in the midst of, of all the world dynamics and all the things that are going on right now. If you don't know that resurrection is real in your life, and it's working in you, and God's working in you, and God's for you, and, and that He wants to flow in your life, I tell you, you're going to struggle. I feel sorry, and I don't mean this in an ugly way at all, but I, I feel sorry for, for Christians who are, who are just, they're just borderline. They're just kind of on the fence, you know, they, they kind of go either way, whatever the, whichever way the wind's blowing, that's kind of which way they go. And, and they don't really grab hold of the, the, the reality, the vitality of Jesus in our lives every day. I don't want to be like that. How about you? No, I tell you, I want, that, I want the resurrection to be a part of my life. And uh, Paul said this in Philippians 3.10. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Bible. Paul said, my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and, now listen to this, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly, more clearly, and that I may in the same way come to know the power outflowing from the resurrection come to know the power outflowing from the resurrection that's what i want to talk to you about because if you'll understand that when jesus was raised from the dead it changed everything it changed all of humanity see we sit here two thousand years uh, plus and we look back on that and we read about it and we 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 have knowledge in certain areas and and we think, yeah, uh, we, we know that. But, but if you don't understand what happened before the resurrection, you won't really appreciate what you have today. Listen, nobody worshiped like you worshiped t tonight before the resurrection. There was no such thing. Oh, yeah, people sang songs and and, and they, would, they would put on sackcloth and ashes and they would worship, but, but not like you. Not from a heavenly standpoint. Not from a standpoint of the Holy Spirit in you. And, and singing out of revelation. And that all came because of Jesus. When Jesus was raised from the dead, now listen to this. He created a whole new life for mankind. Something that had never been experienced before. It wasn't just a new religion. It was a new life, a new lifestyle, a new way of living totally and completely. It was a total demarcation from the past, whether you were a Jew or a Gentile. It was a total change to a whole different way of living. It's amazing that in the midst of that whole new change, the old life still went on. It still goes on today. And it's getting more corrupt and more ugly every day. But that's not us. That's not us. 
You know, we, we kind of complain, so now oh, I'll tell you the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, you're right. It is. But that's not us. Why? Because that resurrection has changed my life, my lifestyle, my direction, my purpose, my motives, my future. It's changed everything. It's interesting that, that out of a nucleus, really, of at first just a few people on the day of Pentecost to 3,000 right after the day of Pentecost till then another 3,000. And all of a sudden, something that started because of the resurrection, Jesus became that seed. He said in John chapter 12, verse 24, except a seed dies, it abides alone. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Jesus was that seed for our life. And it began to multiply, and it began to grow, and it was actually called the way. Acts chapter 9, he was talking about Paul here. He said Paul, who was again at that time Saul, was, was uh, let, me, let me read you this out of the King, uh, New King James. It says Saul was still breathing threats and murders against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, asked letters from them to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. This, this concept, this Christian concept, was not a political thing. It was not even a religious thing. It was a way. It was a way of living. It was a way that had never before been. Acts chapter 24, verse 14 says this. For this I confess to you, this is Paul speaking, that according to the way, you got it? Now listen to this, which they call a sect, so that I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law of the prophets, I have hope in God. Now, now listen to this, listen to what else he says, which they themselves also accept that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself also strive to have a conscious uh, without offense toward God and men. Now listen to this. He said that this was a, was a way, y'all still here, which they called a sect. In other words, a religion or an offshoot of a religion. Oh, that's just a sect of the Jews, you know, and, and, that, and you know, they're led by that guy, Jesus, and it's just a sect. No, it wasn't. It was a way. It was a dynamic new way to live. And sometimes we, we, we just kind of float past it because, well, I'm a Christian. Yeah, but are you in the way? I don't mean did you get in somebody's way. I mean, are you walking in the way? The Bible says in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, Now, when they did find them, they dragged them, Jason and some of the brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, These who have turned the world upside down have come here to us. This was not just a sect that would die off with the, with the death of the of the leader, it was a way that was created by the resurrection of a leader. So if you understand that, you, you understand, hey, I'm, I'm involved with something here as a Christian that's not just, well, Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus. Listen. I'm not in any of those. 
I'm of the way. Because you can be a Christian and be going to hell. Technically. Because I know people that say they're Christians. Hey. They ain't Christians. How do you know? Because I watch the fruit. So, a, a, a religious society has been built out of Christianity. For those who wanted to be Christians but didn't want to have to be part of the way. So they got in the way. Because now everybody identifies, now listen to this, everybody identifies people, people of the way as Christians. But you know, I mean, and, and look, and I don't mean this, I'm not trying to justify anything that the, that the Muslims are doing or anything that Islam says, but, but Christians did do atrocities in the name of Jesus, of protecting the faith. We don't have to protect the faith. It protects us. So, what Jesus started was not a sect. It turned into a religion, but really what Jesus started was a new way. A new way of living, a new life, a new lifestyle, a new way of demonstrating the love of God. Now, it starts with this. And see, sometimes, you know, you hear this, you know, well, I've heard that before. Well, you better listen to me tonight. Jesus said in John chapter 3, Verse 7, you must be born again. You cannot be a part of the way. Now, you can be a Christian without being born again if you claim Christianity. You can do good deeds in the name of Christianity. But if you're going to be a part of Jesus, you have to be born again. I can't make you born again. I can't declare you born again. But I can, I can pretty much watch you and tell you whether you are or not just by your lifestyle. Hallelujah. Amen. I read this Sunday, but in Romans 6, chapter 4, it says, We're buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. The resurrection brought a new life. Now, look, I, I'm not like a lot of people, okay? I wasn't really raised in church, okay? Uh, I, my, if I stayed with my grandparents, I went to church. I'm probably still a member of Summer Grove Baptist Church. <laughs> Amen. I bet I'm still on the rolls. You know, I went to Summer Grove Baptist Church when it was just a little white, wooden country church on Mansfield Road. So, so I had to go. If they went, I went. You just didn't stay in their house and not go to church. You know, and I, I've told this story before, but, you know, my, my mother, bless her heart, she didn't go to church, but she thought I ought to go to church. And so she'd take me to, on Sunday morning, she'd make me get up and get dressed and drive me to the, to the First Baptist Church in Centerville, Mississippi, let me off at the front door and watch me walk through the door. But what she didn't know was I walked down the aisle. You know, most Baptist churches are laid out just the same. Okay, walked down the aisle, around the back, and went out the back door. And I went to see a, 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 a friend of mine uh, uh, live right behind the church, and I'd go, I'd go visit with her till church was over, or sit on the front porch or do something. And you know, with the Baptists, and I'm not mocking the Baptists, I'm just saying that you could set your watch, they're going to be through at noon. Now, I don't know whether that's the case now, but back then it was. Is it still that way, Sam? You don't know, do you? <laughs> Did you do that? Were you like that? Getting out by noon? 
I don't believe that. I don't believe you were like that. But so I'd come back up the I'd come back up the front. If I was a little early, I'd stand up and I'd peek through the baptistry, you know, look over and look out. And I was terrible. I'm just I was bad. And uh, and then I'd walk out and I'd walk down to the car and get in the car. Well, I told that story in church one time here, and my mother was here and she almost passed out. <laughs> so I really wasn't raised in church. So when I got saved, I got saved. I didn't join the church. I got saved. I mean, I was born again. And I think every person ought to know that experience in their lives. <clears throat> and if you don't, I'm concerned about you. Now, I know some people were raised in church and and they've served Jesus their whole lives. But I'm going to tell you, I don't, care, I don't care how old you were when you started going to church or serving God. There was some point in your life where you know that Jesus came into your heart. That the Holy Spirit convicted you and you, He came in your heart and you were born again. Because Jesus said so. Okay. And so there's no demarcation if you're not born again. There may be a socialization toward Christianity, but there's no life without being born of God, being born again. Paul said, if any man be in Christ, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You become a new creature in Christ. Amen? So that's what tells me whether you're a Christian or not is are you walking in the way? Not what church you're a member of. I, I talk to people all the time. That's the first thing. Well, I'm a member of such and such church. I'm glad you go to church. But are you born again? Because that's what Jesus, that's what the resurrection did. Okay? It gave us the ability to die with Him and be raised to newness of life. Everybody still with me? You, you've got to know that in your life. But now here's what I want you to see out of this for a minute. Listen to this. You have to fight for that new man. How many of you noticed after you got saved, you still had to fight some things off? You still had temptation. You still had struggle. How many of you still do? Well, if you're breathing, you do. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 says that you put on the new man. Which was, now listen to this, which was created according to God in true righteousness. You have to fight for that. Well, how, well, how do you fight? Well, verse 22 says, you put off concerning your former conduct. The old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. You've got to fight for that new man. We had a prayer request tonight about some, some men that, that just got saved. They're drug addicts. And they just got saved. They've got a fight ahead of them. See, people say, well, you get saved. You know, that's it. That, you know everything's going to be fine. No, you've got a fight on your hands. Because everything in your past will try to come back and haunt you and try to pull you down and draw you back and get you back in. But you don't have to because sin doesn't have dominion over you anymore. I don't have to do that. I don't want to do that. But that doesn't mean it doesn't call you. So you have to fight off that old life, and you've got to fight to let that new man shine. That's the first order of business as a, as a, as, as a resurrected child of God, is you've got to live that life. Second thing, that the resurrection did, and there, there are a lot. I'm, not going, I'm just talking about a few here tonight. And this is the thing um, that, that you have to understand, is it gave us something that had never before been before, and that is a personal relationship with our Father, with God. Do you know that before that, there was no personal relationship? Any communication had to go through the priest. You didn't dare 
communicate with the Father. We have religion today called Christian Christianity. Catholicism, you don't go to the Father. I do. I do. Now, I'm not, look, hey, I'm just telling you. Listen, I go straight to the Father. I don't, Mary, I don't know what's going on with her, but I know she's not. At, listen, I know one thing. She's not at the right hand of the Father. I know she's not closer than Jesus. I mean, she was a great lady. Probably the strongest woman ever known to man. I mean, my goodness. But the point is, she was just a human. I, I, I don't have to go to her. I, I, I have access to the Father. Listen to what Jesus said in John 16. He was talking about dying and being raised from the dead. He said, uh, Therefore you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. And your joy no one will take from you. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, He will give it to you. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, don't go talk to Mama. You go talk to the Father. You don't use Mama's name. You use my name. And whatever you ask, y'all still here? Whatever you ask, the Father in my name, He will give to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. Let me read the rest of this, just so you, you can understand what Jesus is saying. These things I've spoken to you in a figurative language, but the time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. Not about God, about the Father. You know, I listen to people pray sometimes. And, and if, all, if, if, if they, all they do is talk about God and they're praying to God, I wonder about their relationship. He is God, but when I talk to Him, He's my Father. Now, I'm not being critical of anybody. You know, I think sometimes we just do that out of habit. But He's my Father. Jesus gave me a relationship with His Daddy, with His Father. And now I have the same relationship that He does. In that day when you will ask uh, in my name, and I do not say to you that I shall pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loves you. Isn't that good? Because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. But he left a treasure for us. He left something that had never before been. He left us with a relationship with the Father. Under the old covenant, they would, they would go into the Holy of Holies and they would tie a rope around their leg. And they had bells on the skirt of their robe. And they, and they would go into the Holy of Holies. A priest would go in to offer sacrifices. That's as close as you could get to God. And they'd go in. As long as they heard those bells tinkling, they knew everything was all right. But if the bells quit tinkling, they pulled them out with that rope. Because more than likely they were dead. <laughs> Moses, the Bible says he was in the presence of God. The glory of God was on him, but it faded. It didn't stay. But see, you have a different glory. 
because you have a heavenly Father. Jesus said, uh, the, the Hebrews says this about Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we have a priest who sympathizes with our weaknesses and was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Now listen to this. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I go to the throne. I don't have to have a rope tied around my ankle. I don't have to have bells on my jeans. All I have to do is go in His presence. And because I go in His presence, that came about because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He was raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for us. There's absolutely nothing that you can do, listen to me, that Jesus can't talk to the Father about and fix for your life. Because He's been touched in all points. Well, you don't know what I did. Listen to me. It doesn't matter what you did. What matters is you have a mediator and he's already been there. And the good news is he's your father. Jesus changed the relationship. He gave us a sonship relationship because of his resurrection. You've got to understand that. That, that, that. that wasn't around. It wasn't even conceivable. In fact, the, 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 the Pharisees got furious because Jesus called God his Father. Here's something else that happened that always, to this day, still amazes me. Jesus' resurrection, you know, you know that you know, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. But the other side of that is that Jesus so loved us, He was willing to die. Okay? But now listen to this. When Jesus was raised from the dead, He created a community. We call it a communion. A worldwide communion. Worldwide I can go anywhere in the world. And you say, oh, there's some places there aren't Christians. That's not true. It's like Chinese food. You say, huh? Listen, I have been all over the world. You can find good Chinese food anywhere in the world. I mean, I've been, I mean, I don't care. You can go to the Ukraine and they got Chinese food. I was in the Philippines out in the middle of nowhere in a town called Cotbologan. They had to, you could fly in on a little small plane and they had to run the cows off the runway. They'd get in low and run the cows off the runway so they could land. But they had Chinese food. You, listen, there is nowhere in the world you can go that you cannot find Christians. I'm not about real Christians. I'm talking about people walking in the way. And not only that, because you are of the way, they will receive you even when they can't even speak your language. I have had them invite me into their home. They didn't know me from Adam except they knew I was a Christian and brought me into their house, treated me like a, 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 a member of the family, sacrificed their own food to give me food. And didn't even know me. Barely knew me. Just that I was a Christian. Uh, you've got you've to understand that. Because see, here's what happens. You're afraid of that because so many people are not honest about who they really are. But we are required, according to the Word of God, to be hospitable toward other believers. In fact, the Bible says that if we are hospitable toward other believers, there may be times when we even entertain angels and we don't even know it. 
could give you some testimonies about that. It is a it is a international network. There may be a thousand people in a, in a crowd, but if you praise Jesus, there's going to be somebody in that crowd that's going to come up to you and say, "Me too. I love Jesus." I've experienced it literally, all, I'm telling you, all over the world. Why did that happen? Because of one thing. Jesus was raised from the dead. And listen to me. And he did something with a man by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius was not a Christian. He wasn't a Jew. But he loved God. To me, to me that's amazing. That, that this man wasn't even part of the covenant, but he still loved God. And he helped people, and he gave money, and he prayed. And an angel appeared to him and said, Cornelius, God's heard your prayers. He's seen your giving. And he's going to tell you where life is. And he said, you go down to Simon the Tanner's house. There's a man down there named Peter. And go down there, and he'll come back with you, and he'll tell you about what you need to do. So he sent him down there. Same time, Peter's having an experience with God. Because Peter, he, was not, he, he would not be around the Gentiles. He still thought they were unclean. He hadn't gotten the revelation yet. In fact, most of the, most of the disciples didn't even know that the gospel was for anybody but the Jews. Until this happened. So Peter realized, he, oh, I better go. So he went to his house and walked in, and all these people were there that he would never, ever in a million years be around. They were unclean. If he was around them, he would be, he would be ostracized. And he preached the same message to them that he preached on the day of Pentecost. And while he was speaking that message, it says in verse 44 of Acts chapter 10, the Holy Spirit fell and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, just like on the day of Pentecost. And they all began to speak with tongues. And you know what Peter said? Hmm. I perceive God is no respecter of persons. A worldwide community was born right there. Just out of, the, just out of that, that group of people. There was a worldwide community because God is no respecter of persons. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You ought to and you should respect your fellow Christians. Well, I don't know about their motives. That's where you've got you've to leave that alone. Leave it alone. And you have to walk in love and you have to recognize them as a believer, not as a perfect person. I know you're the only one that's perfect. <laughs> but you've got to recognize. Listen, I think if the body of Christ will start respecting each other, I think God could do a lot more. God could do a lot more. Now, the last thing that I want to talk to you about that, that happened to me, is probably the most amazing thing. And it's the thing that today no one else does but Christians. Now, I'm talking about true Christians, those of the way. In Mark chapter 8, verse 2, well, let's back, I'm going to back up to verse 1. It says, In those days of multitude, being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the multitudes. Now listen to this. Because they have not, they have continued with me three days and have nothing to eat. And then he feeds them. But now listen to me. Here's the key word. A word that was not even hardly mentioned. What even something that, 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 that people understood because it's a heart thing. God deposited compassion in the hearts of Christians. We are the, look, you go all over the world, 
you're not going to see Muslims feeding people. You're not going to see, listen, you're not going to see uh, Hindus feeding people except their own. We feed everybody. We love everybody. We want to help anybody. Why? Why is that? Because there's something on the inside of a Christian. It's called compassion. The word there is, is where we get our word spleen. It means literally to be moved by your inward parts. I've seen you guys be moved when, when, when we have something, some project for some nation or we're going to do something. And I've seen God, you, you don't do it with your head, you do it with your in, insides. That's compassion. When somebody has a need and you see that need, you respond to it. Do you know that's not normal? That's not normal. The world doesn't, they don't, they don't get Christians. i never forget when, when we first went, invaded Afghanistan the first time. When we, when we went into Afghanistan, into, into Kabul, and the, and the military was going through, they went to this one prison, and there were two American missionaries, women, in that prison because they had been over there feeding the poor, and they put them in prison. They asked them, uh, what have you been doing? We've been praying. We've just been praying. We've just been praying. We've been praying. And by the way, they were spirit-filled Christians because they said, we've been praying in other tongues. We've been praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, what would drive someone to go into that kind of a hostile environment to feed people, to help people? Only compassion that comes from God. And when you make Jesus the Lord of your life, that compassion enters into you. Now, you, you, the Bible says that you can, you can squelch it, you can push it down, you can ignore it, and you all have. You've all turned the channels when you saw all those little starving babies. <laughs> Click the channel. Go to another channel. Don't look at me so holy. But that compassion belongs to us. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 says, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion one, for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. That's not natural. That came because of the resurrection. That came because Jesus imparted his life to you. He was a man of compassion. It says in, uh, let me read you this scripture, 1 John chapter 3. Verse 16. So this will tell you whether you're a Christian or not. By this we know love, because He laid down His life for us. And we also, everybody say we also. Yeah, that's talking about you and me. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. You got it? The word there, ought to, literally is a, is a, 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 a payment of debt. It's a debt that's owed. Now listen to what it says in verse 17. Whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart, that's the same word, compassion. Shuts up his, the, the word there really is, if you want to get technical, is the word bowels, your inward parts. Shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Boy, that's pretty strong. That's strong. It's the same compassion Jesus had. 
the, the Bible here, this, this, this is a little confusing uh, sometimes to people because it, it doesn't mean, I, I don't think it means what a lot of people think it means. Sometimes you, you don't have the ability to help somebody. How many of you have ever had compassion on somebody, but you couldn't help them? You didn't, have, you didn't have what it took. The Amplified Bible says, If anyone has this world's goods or resources for sustaining, li sustaining life. In other words, you can feel something, but not have the ability to do anything about it. I've had that happen to me. Hey, you go to third world nations, and I'm going to tell you right now, you can see more than you could ever do. But God will present to you personally. Okay, listen to me. He will present to you personally opportunities for your heart to be touched. Simple things sometimes. But you have to make up your mind you are not going to shut up your bowels of compassion, the King James says. You're not going to, you're, you're going to, you're gonna, you're, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm going to do something. I, I got to help. You may have felt this, now, I don't, I don't necessarily think that you ought to hand money out the window every time somebody's got a sign saying need money. But I tell you what, there have been times where I have seen somebody holding up one of those signs, and I mean, I was moved. And I had to do something. I don't pick up hitchhikers. I wouldn't recommend it. But I was on the road one time going to Dallas. It was cold. It was 20 degrees. It was the middle of the winter. And, and I was going to Dallas. And I saw this young man standing on the side of the road hitchhiking. Something inside of me. Just, I couldn't, oh, it just... And, I, and to be honest with you, I kind of fought it. I had to go down a mile to the next exit and turn around and come back and pick him up. I mean, I couldn't. I had to pick him up. And I got in, he got in the car and he said, thank you. And, and uh, barely could understand him, kind of mumbled it. And so we're going down the road. And I said, you know, my name is Sam. And he said, my name's Robert. And Robert. That's Robert. Huh? I thought he said Robert first. I said, oh my God. No, he said Robert. And so, as we rode down the road toward Dallas, I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Dallas. I said, well, good, I'm going to Dallas. And so we're right, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, he's hungry. I said, Robert, I'm getting kind of hungry. Can I buy you some breakfast if we, if we stop? And he, he, you could tell his eyes... I didn't realize it at the time, but he'd been standing on that road all night. Just in a little light jacket. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But so we stopped and 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 I bought him breakfast. And we sat there and I started talking to him. And I found out that he'd been living with his dad, and his dad, his dad's girlfriend got mad at him and kicked him out. Just in the middle of the night, just kicked him out, said, get out of here, leave. And he said, I'm going to Dallas to try to find a temporary job, you know, something that pays you every day so I can buy a bus ticket to go home to my mother in Los Angeles. Well, you know what I had to do, don't you? So the rest of the way, I just talked to him about Jesus. And I told him, I said, Jesus really is the one who moved me to stop and pick you up. And I prayed for him and he accepted Jesus into his life and we went to the bus station and um, I bought him a ticket and I stayed there with him till he got on the bus and, and the bus drove off but right before he got on the bus I said Robert I just want you to know I love you and he hugged me tears in his eyes and I love you too you never forget those kind of compassion moments you never forget them I, I want to tell you I thank God that I didn't shut up that. I didn't shut it down. I didn't say, oh, man, it's cold outside. I don't know this guy. 
because God did something. Never have heard from Robert again. I gave him my phone number and told him if he ever needed me to call me. I've never heard from him since. That was 30 years ago probably. Yeah, I forgot. That's right. Yeah, he was coughing because he'd been outside and prayed for him. God touched his body. But the amazing thing is, I believe we all have those opportunities. Those are, listen to me, those are Christian opportunities. Christian opportunities. And all you have to do is make up your mind you're going to let that flow out of you. That came with the resurrection. Wasn't around before. Wasn't around before. People just don't understand it. They don't get it. They don't understand why you go to a group of people that are hostile and you still want to help them. You want to minister to them. There's a lady, and we've had her in the church. We support their ministry. In fact, when are y'all going to Haiti? In July. Um, Danita Estrella, whatever her Watts. Um, she was just a secretary, a church secretary. She wanted to do something for God and went to Haiti and had a compassion for those children that were on the streets and just went. And God's used her and blessed her and we've helped her and got a team going down there in July to, to minister to the kids just because of something moving on the inside. Don't discount that. There are going to be times when you have to stop because something is compelling you to talk to somebody. Don't discount that because that could change somebody's life if you're just willing to do it. The resurrection brought that to us. Gave us the same compassion Jesus had. Isn't that good? Hallelujah. Y'all get anything out of this tonight?